Welcome to the Warrior Razor Podcast. We're your hosts, Angela and Carrie. We all need help and support to stay focused and challenged to courageously pursue the life God has called us to live. What we do matters. Here on the Warrior Razor Podcast, we seek Jesus first and use the skills, talents, and passions He has given us second. Let me give you a more formal bio about our friend Kitty. So Kitty is a builder of leaders, teams, and organizations. She leads the ministry of Prime Movers, a marketplace leader discipleship program of Living on the Edge in her role as president. She also serves on the executive team of Living on the Edge, leading the ministry's culture and organizational development. She's the owner of Built to Lead, the Allen Group, a leadership development firm founded in 2004. She draws from over 30 years of experience in the corporate world and as a nonprofit entrepreneur. Her consulting practice is focused on building leaders through training, board, and staff development. Kitty is a graduate of Southern Methodist University with a Bachelor's of Business Administration degree and a Master of Business Administration degree. She has four adult children, three grandchildren, and resides in Central Ohio. So glad that you get to meet Kitty today. Let's head into our interview. Good morning, warriors. Time to start your day. Keep your head up, marching on. Don't let nothing stand in your way. Well, welcome to the Warrior Razor podcast. I'm Angela Johnson. I have my co-host Carrie Smith with me today, as always. And I am super excited to have a new guest on the show and a new friend to me. Carrie, you you guys go back. So uh, I know that... Not like super far, but okay. I've had several people. So Kitty goes to my church. Love that. Yeah. Um, and I had several people that were like, Carrie, you need to know Kitty. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's a person that you needed to know, I need to know, and now yeah. our listeners and viewers were excited for you so to meet excited. Kitty. So yeah. Thank you for being here with us, Kitty. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and kind invitation. I've been looking forward to uh, just sharing some some of my experience and my faith journey with y'all and uh, talking about what's the next best step. So yes. what y'all are doing. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So with that, we're kind of casual here, but will you give us like a 30,000 foot view of who you are? So if someone hasn't followed you or seen what you're up to, they could just get to know you a little bit better. Happy yeah. To, yeah. So I like to start with the fact that I am a child of God by grace. That is my core identity. And uh, I am a mother to four unique, wonderful individuals and uh, uh, also mother-in-law to uh, my precious uh, in-laws. And then uh, Gaga to three precious grandchildren. So family tradition, family tradition of my going back to generations is the oldest grandchild gets to name the grandparents. So okay. growing up, we always had weird grandparent names and great grandparent names. And so my oldest um, uh, grandbaby, Jack, he's two and a half. When he was not quite 18 months, he tried to say grandma and it came out Gaga. <laughs> so it... <laughs> Ugly. That is officially the first Gaga. I have never met a Gaga. I always like to ask my my friends who are in the grandmother realm, what are your kid what are, what do the kiddos call you? But that's my first Gaga. So thank yes. you for that. I love I might Gaga too. I might adopt that tradition. I love that. <laughs> really fun. Yeah. And so um yeah, so he named me and all my grandkids will call me Gaga. So uh <laughs> it's it's a, a title that I warmly embrace. Oh, that's it. a little bit about my family. Um I was married for 27 years to my absolute best soulmate, uh, best friend, partner in ministry, partner in business, partner in life. And uh, sadly, he uh, was called home to be with the Lord uh, very suddenly 15 years ago. So I've walked the uh, path of widowhood at a young age with four kids to raise and then a business to take over and run and uh, just figure out, you know, what what is it that God has me here for? And that's a key part of my story that really uh, I can share that has given me some clarity about God's purpose for me specifically and why he has me here. So I, uh, I have learned. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get into that. Why don't we? Like, I'd love to hear that. I mean, you just hit it right out of the bat. Like, let's, let's start talking about that. Yeah. 
So uh, I was, give you a little background, I was the first in my family to become a believer at age 15. Uh, we thought we were Christian just because we weren't Jewish, you know, and, and being raised in the Chicago area, you're one or the other. So, uh, <laughs> so, but I never went to church, didn't, you know, that just wasn't a part of um, my upbringing. But I remember uh, at five years old, the Lord, I, I know it was the Holy Spirit, he was nudging me and beginning to woo me to him. And I was five years old, got up, put, it was a Sunday morning, put on my best party dress and shoes, knocked on my parents' door and said, can we go to church today? How in the world did I even think about that? I was five. I, I had never right. been there. But I think God was beginning to woo me. And so at that time, my parents, they were very sweet. We we're a very close family. But they said, no, honey, we don't do that. And so I was like, okay. Went back in my room, hung up my little dress, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, but fast forward, when I was a teenager in high school, one of my best friends was involved in a ministry called uh, Campus Life, which at the time was Campus Crusades High School Ministry. <clears throat> Excuse me, allergy season here. Yes, I feel that. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I went to to club and, and really loved it. You know, just it was fun. It was a great way to get to know a little bit about, you know, God and his word. And then uh, I ended up going to camp that summer which is yeah. where I, I first heard the gospel and accepted Christ. And I had never felt such a sense of freedom in my life as I mm -hmm. did that moment. And I knew the Holy Spirit was, you know, just, just completely swarmed me with his love and peace. The ironic part is that our guest speaker at that um, camp was a guy named Hal Lindsey, if you know the late great planet Earth. Oh, yeah. Google it, look it up. It was all... Yeah. The entire teaching was all hellfire and damnation. All these kids were raising their hands buying fire insurance. <laughs> but it it was um, it was just such an incredible transformational moment for me when I accepted Christ. So of course I come back, fifteen years old. I don't know the gospel, how to share it up up one end or down the other. But I was so scared to death for my parents' salvation because of what I just heard. Sure. So I tried to share, and my parents thought I was in a cult or, you know, what in the world? That's crazy. But started, that was my journey with Christ. That was my uh, early discipleship wow. journey and learned the power and importance of prayer to mm -hmm. plow, uh, plow the soil of someone's heart to be able to receive the Holy Spirit at some point in time. And Can I just pause you for a minute? Cause you've said some really cool things, just like speaking to my spirit as a mom and just the fact that I, I think when our kiddos come to us with just that innocence and, and to sit in that for a second, and we, Carrie and I have chatted about this on the podcast before that when our kiddos come to know who Jesus is, they don't have a junior version of the Holy Spirit living within them. And so the fact that the Lord was wooing you even then is so uh, just powerful and just it, it touches my heart uh, in a special way because it I think sometimes as moms or as parents we can dismiss them oh little minds little hearts little spirits and no God is is it will pursue them too in such a precious way oh and brings my heart that you had to put your dress back in the closet <laughs> I know <laughs> I know I can still see it in my mind's eye that moment but um Here's the good news. God is so faithful. So in, in one sense, he called me to be a missionary to my own family. Yeah. And the good news is, is that I was the first to become a believer, but not the last. Yeah. And my mom came to uh, saving faith in literally a miraculous, like, mm -hmm. I don't want to go into it, but it was miraculous. <laughs> and um, she was 55 years old. And then my dad, he was a tough Stanford engineer, lifelong agnostic, right? Two months before he passed, he accepted the Lord. Wow. And then my 97-year-old grandmother, one month before she passed, accepted the Lord. So that's the beauty of how God works in uh, our families, in our lives. And just as we walk with him and try to become more and more like him, living out our faith imperfectly, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is faithful and he is faithful to pray, to answer prayers. Um, my my. I prayed for my family since I was 15 and uh, he was faithful to bring them into the kingdom. So I really love that you're sharing that. Sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I love that you're sharing that because I do think there's such, it's so hard to wait. Yeah. It's so hard to say, you know, to, to know in your head and your heart that God hears you and that God loves your family even more than you do, <laughs> you know, um, yet to have to wait and to, to, to not be able to just be like, God, like 
make the decision for them and to allow family, you know, to come to that decision themselves. And um, thanks for sharing that. Cause I know um, that's not, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't easy, easy in one respect, because you knew God was good and you knew that, that you could trust him with your family, but I'm sure it wasn't easy in moments where, you know, you're like, just get it, just get it already. You know? Um, uh, because I, I think that there are a lot of people that have been praying for a long time for their family. Um, and, and, and it, to hear that, that, that side of the story that they came, came to know Christ and came to salvation, uh, can just really help spur some on on to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Stand in that gap. Yeah. Keep praying, keep praying. Yep. Yes. Yes. And claiming God's promises too. So, right. so fast forward, um, that's a little bit about kind of my beginning of my faith journey. Um, went to school in Texas, uh, fell in love with the oil business, or as they say down there, the oil business. Oil and, business. <laughs> So out of grad school, I uh, took a job in the oil field equipment industry, which was super fun. Loved it. Um, Houston, Texas, back in the oil boom days. I had a hard hat and heels and those good old boys didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. A hard hat and heels. I love it. I love it. That's, a good, I, that's a good show notes. Uh, yeah, that needs to be a t-shirt. Yeah. I, I've also heard that should be a country western song, but yeah, there you go. Yes, it should. <laughs> but uh, yeah, loved what I did, loved, you know, just the whole experience. I knew I would be going into business. Um, and that's where I met and married my my late husband, who was a pastor. And so uh, that began our journey of just partnership. Um, you know, as I shared before, uh, with everything, three of our kids were born in Houston. And then we were uh, actually called to plant a church, which brought me brought us back up here to Ohio. Okay. Uh, back in 1991. And uh, we've got one Buckeye in the family. My youngest son was born here in Ohio. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so just a really incredible journey. And the the seasons of my life, God's either called me into business or or ministry, business ministry. And um, I, I see it as all of a piece. And so what he's made clear to me is my calling is to build strong kingdom leaders, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's in ministry, uh, whether it's in the community, um, what dislocates my heart is broken Christian leadership because mm -hmm. I think it can have eternal impact. Mm -hmm. And so I am uh, called to stand in the gap and to build leaders, again, whether their context is marketplace or ministry, but to really be intentional and purposeful about uh, understanding who they are, how God has uniquely gifted and created them, and then step out into uh, meaningful service, step out into your purpose. Wow, I'm kidding. You're just saying like everything, like oh our goodness. byline for the ministry at Warrior Razors and like plug and chug, like that is, that so aligns with our hearts too. And we do have quite a few uh, women who listen to the show who are starting a thing or, or maybe they know that the Lord has implanted a dream or a calling within them. And they're just really trying to cultivate that in this season. One of the things that I read in your bio, and I was like so excited to ask you about this, is about the part the part about helping cultivate or you or you love helping people with spiritual entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I have never heard that phrase before. Will you talk to us about what that is and what that looks like for you and what you do? Certainly. So one aspect of my um, of my calling is I lead a ministry called Prime Movers. So really, I, I um, I've been asked this question a lot. Like, you seem like you wear different hats and do different things. And that's true. I, I have what I consider four key platforms of what God's called me to. Number one is my family, to serve and, and love on my family. Second is I'm a part of the Built to Lead uh, band of builders, we call ourselves. And that's more of a executive coaching, leadership, and team development. But it's a very holistic uh, approach to it. It's not a, you know, turn to page 15 and answer these questions. It's, it's right. a deep, deep dive. Um, and then at Living on the Edge, where I'm, I serve on the executive team, and Prime Movers is a ministry of Living on the Edge. So I've been involved with that for 12 years. Um, that's really where God got a hold of me to reveal my specific Ephesians 2.10 calling, which is to build kingdom leaders. Mm -hmm. And so through Prime Movers, we help mostly marketplace leaders to understand, here's who they are, here's who they are in Christ, how God has uniquely gifted and created them, and then help them understand what dislocates their heart. What are they called to? Where do they want to make a difference? And it could be in the context of their, their current platform, their work, their business, or maybe he's calling them to start something new. 
But the term spiritual entrepreneur is really about what is the new thing God wants to do in and through us to impact his world for good. Yeah. God is actively at work all over, as we know. And uh, it's just a, an amazing privilege for me to have a front row seat to see his spirit move in power. Um, I also serve on a ministry, uh, on the board of a ministry called Big Life, which is, uh, we're in over 162 countries right now. And Big Life is a um, discipleship ministry, really. It's about disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So that multiplication awesome. approach. And it helps people reach their own people uh, with the gospel. And so that's the the fourth platform of what I'm called to do. And so I get to build into, you know, not only our fellow board members, but um, our executive team there at that ministry. And uh, just, again, I, I like to say I'm I'm a widow from flyover country. I'm a very normal person that uh, God has called specifically to step into these spaces and trust him as I walk with him. One of my favorite quotes is by um, Oswald Chambers. I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. Chambers writes, all of God's people are ordinary people who have been made extraordinary by the purpose he has given them. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about my passion and uh, my passion for spiritual entrepreneurship, because that means someone is clearly stepping into God's unique Ephesians 2.10 calling for their life. So cool. I feel like when I, when I hear you talk about your story, um, I feel like there is, and you used the word earlier, this wooing. Mm -hmm. This, this constant wooing of, of you started it, you know, when you were five and then continued when you were 15 and, and this wooing you into using your talents and your, your gifts and your passion specifically for the kingdom of God. I think there are so many Christians out there that uh, separate the two. And I did for a long time as well. I would have, I would have said out loud, Oh yeah. Like everybody's in ministry, you know, everybody is called to, you know, I knew the great commission and, and I knew that we were, but, but for some reason there was this separation in my mind and my heart about, you know, workplace carry and, and ministry carry or, or, um, passion the what I'm passionate about and, and, and what my work is. And like, like the, the beauty of what you do. And I think how God is created you and wooed you into him is like, you get the concept of how all those work together and then your passion to just bring people into that. I love, I love that. I think that's part of what we're, you know, we're trying to cultivate here, here with warrior razor and our warrior woman tribe is, is just to remind people that their relationship with Jesus is first mm -hmm. and foremost. And then from that flows, God gives us our passions and our, our talents and our, and, and, and our desires. Um, and then, and then stewarding those for him is really like a lifelong process. You know, yeah. you can clarity and absolutely. I love that you have like your, you know, you know, your four things that God's calling you to, but you know, I, and actually maybe this is a question, would you say those even could change over time or, or more for move or how, how would you explain that? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, this is my personal philosophy, but I, I have seen it borne out. Uh, I think there is what, what uh, at Built to Lead, we fondly call a melody line. There's a mm -hmm. DNA that God has, has placed in us that is consistent over time. And um, I'll, I'll share a very embarrassing story. <laughs> we're, we're here for embarrassing. We love it. <laughs> Get real, real fast. <laughs> Oh, I never saw myself as as having leadership gifts or leadership abilities, but other people had. And from a very young age, and I'm not kidding when I, I tell you this, it's not made up. So, you know, the, the back in the 60s, the group, the monkeys, you know, hey, hey, we're the monkeys. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. For you youngsters, look it up, Google it. <laughs> so they were like, they were like the, the group that, you know, all, the girls all thought they were so cool, that kind of thing. So three of my best friends and I, we started what we called a monkey club. So after we got home from elementary school, we'd go over to Madeline's house and, you know, each one of us would, would champion one of the four monkeys. Like, I so love how this is like seared into your mind. Like you have like the details. <laughs> so stupid. The whole thing was so stupid. <laughs> and so we went around and my friends picked the cuter guys first and I got stuck with the dorky looking guy, but whatever. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, and you're going to be the president of the monkeys club. I was like, what? Yeah. First of all. <laughs> <This is dumb. laughs> but that was like the first, you know, where the light bulb, you know, kind of, you know how 
God gives you a nudge and it's like, sure huh, I, okay, yep. I'll, I'll, I don't know what leading a monkey club is, but we'll, <laughs> we'll do it. But consistently <laughs> from then on, um, he has clear, made it really clear to me. He's called me into different leadership roles, you know, high school, college, you know, beyond. And um, yeah, so from the monkey club to the hard hat and heels, <laughs> here we are today, you know, all yeah. the, all the, I love that you said the melody line. We talk about how there are, there's certain things that are woven through the fabric of our DNA. That's what we've talked about here on the show with the warrior razor. And it's the same concept, no matter where you are in the marketplace, secular, sacred, wherever those, right. those same still, those notes still apply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to answer Carrie's question, you know, there's that melody line. So leadership has always been at the core of what I feel called to. Um, and and just in a, in a holistic sense, in fact, uh, but it has taken different contexts. So, um, we talk about in prime movers, you know, knowing what our core is uh, built to lead. We talk about building our strong personal core, which I can go into, um, knowing what our capacity is and then knowing our context. And oftentimes in life, what I've seen is, your capacity needs to be addressed constantly. Carrie and I have had conversations about this. Like, you yes. know, uh, I'm not the best at managing margin in my life. You know, it's. <laughs> yeah. Talk to Carrie because she st- took on the PTO president role this year. Because that's. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Do you yeah. have capacity for this, Fred? I know you're high capacity. You, but do you have to... capacity for this. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not the one to coach you in, in managing margin because that's just <laughs> not my superpower. We all have our limits. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Um, but your your capacity can change, you know, over time and specifically the context can change. And so to your point or to your question, Carrie, I would say, you know, for any of our listeners, um, you know, God is calling each of us to be a difference maker yeah. in the world, in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in the kingdom and being sensitive to what season of life you're in, uh, where that context may change. But just know what your your melody line is. Know what your core passion is. Some people are so gifted with service. You know, Mm -hmm. that might be their top spiritual gift. And that's where they feel most fully alive. Um, That's going to be true for for them. Someone who has a teaching gift or, um, you know, the gift of mercy. Uh, Mm -hmm. Those are really strong drivers. And so knowing that how God has uniquely gifted us, um, I, I would say start with something as simple as, you know, building your core. What's your worldview? What do you believe and why? Mm -hmm. We have to start with, with our beliefs. Um, Why am I here? Why does God have me here on this earth? Mm -hmm. Uh, What is he calling me to do? Uh, We have to ask and answer those questions throughout our lives. Sensitive to to the season of life you're in. Yeah. The the context may change. Yeah. I, I feel like this is, um, you know, we're getting to that, to, to this, the theme of this year's podcast is what's your next right thing, right? And what's your next right step. And so all of these things are speaking towards that. If you haven't, um, really asked God, right. What is, you know, what's the melody of my life? What have you gifted me at? Um, and, and, and this, you know, knowing your season. So let's maybe move into that. Is that okay? If we move into, kind of oh, getting yeah. to that, how, how do you, you can either share it through some of your life experience or, um, you know, as a, as, as you have helped, you know, kingdom minded people move into, to all of, I, I think I'm most excited about this piece of the content because I know this is what you do for people. This is, you help them discover what their next right step is. Um, so let's talk about all the ways, tangible ways you might do that. And I'm sure we could fill like hours because I, I know that this is, it's, it can be very intricate. It can be very step-by-step, but but share with us what, you, what you've planned to share with us on that topic. Certainly. Well, yeah. I would start, and if I can screen share. Yeah. Walk us through. Yeah. And if you, um, if you're listening and not watching, we're going to make sure we give this, um, make this available in our show notes. Um, and, and, and Kitty is as well going to talk through everything. So that's right. Thank you, Carrie. Mm-hmm. So, uh, at built to lead, we, we start with, um, asking and answering th- three key questions in life and the right order that we ask and answer them is what I want to address. And I think this is a good first next best step. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, this is, you know, for all of us normal average people, we ask the question, how do I, how I live or what is it I do that will help answer the question of who am I? 
mm. which will then finally explain why I live. Right. We think that is a, a, an order of asking and answering those questions that can easily lead to the performance trap and yeah. a life that may not feel genuine to you. Yeah. Um, how many times when we meet someone new, you know, introduce your names, shake hands, what's the next question that's usually asked? What do you do for a living? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so the the performance trap or the the dysfunctional trap that can lead to is that we identify ourselves by what we do. Yeah. And guess what? When that changes, that's when things can fall off the rails. I'm a teacher, I'm an accountant, I'm a stay-at-home mom, I'm a homeschool teacher, I'm a pastor, I'm a business owner. Well, if one of those things goes away, then who yeah. am I? Yeah, if you're who, if you're do, it becomes your, is your who, like you, it, you lose it. Yeah. yeah. When you're in crisis, you, you yeah. quickly, yeah. So we believe, and it stems from uh, obviously knowing our worldview, uh, what do we believe, that answering, asking and answering the questions in this order is a much more healthy way to find and author your your opus or your calling. So first, ask why I live. What is my purpose? Well, it comes from knowing your worldview. A worldview, I love the philosopher James Sire. He describes a worldview as a set of beliefs that informs all thought and action. Mm -hmm. It's a very big statement. Yeah. And so most people go through life, they don't really know what they believe. Yeah, you know, exactly. starting starting with the faith questions, st starting with why am I here? Mm -hmm. You know, what is my purpose? Uh, we have to know that. And so it it doesn't come by osmosis. You have to really be intentional about yeah. thinking that through. Yeah, I was going to say that that one question alone um, is, yep. feels kind of exhausting. <laughs> like that is that is a lot of work to put in, but that foundation to to help you build to know that next that that will be your foundation for your next right steps. Exactly, um, that's so good. Well, and three years ago, I was finalizing a manuscript that was answering this very question because I felt like I was in this constant repeat conversation with women, moms, is what I'm doing enough? Is this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is God calling me? And I, I'm like, why do I keep having this conversation? And if you don't have a biblical worldview, you really don't have a full, uh, the full picture of what the answer is and what he's asking, what he's, what he's calling us uniquely to do. And I picked up on what you said, the opus line. I mean, I love the musical theme here. And I, it, I just was thinking about this and you can speak to this kitty, but have you ever, have you guys ever heard someone sing the national anthem in a stadium and they're, they're singing it like standard melody and then they'll skit scat, go off the melody line. And you're like, what is this song they are now singing? And it's like, can we just get back to what like the rest of the nation is singing with you? <laughs> it's like, great. You have a, a fabulous voice, but where did the melody line go? And I think sometimes that can apply to our lives too. It's like, okay, we, we need to know the melody line. So if we, skit scat and do a little trill here and there wherever but we can come back to that that underlying right note line so i don't know if you've got thoughts on that related to your your three steps uh, to answer this question here yeah 100 percent um and so i i think that once we know um our purpose you know why we are here why do i live you know, I, I, I know Carrie, I, Angela, I'm just getting to know you, but you each have a unique purpose created uh, specifically for you from eternity past, right? Ephesians 2.10 by God. Um, I do as well. I, I've got countless examples of others that once we know, based on our worldview, our beliefs, I'm a child of God, I'm here for a purpose, I'm clear about stepping into it, then that, that leads us to understand what our true identity is. So our identity is not derived from something that can be, you know, changeable and temporal, right? It's it's from the eternal. And mm -hmm. so finding our, our true identity, uh, we can we can, especially as women, we can tend to um, draw our or author our identity based on either what we do or who we're in relationship with. Um, but then there's a core as part of your essence that is truly you, only you. Um, and knowing what that is, is such a healthy next step because uh, guess what? When I was widowed suddenly, I literally felt like my identity was cut in two. I, you know, I, I just had to 
just recalibrate, okay, come back to my purpose, who I am, who I am in Christ, and then how has he uniquely gifted me? And then now I've under, understood over the last several years even more of what my true identity is. And it's such a freeing um, knowledge that you can you can step right back into what you know he's calling you to if you know who you truly are. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, the third question then, uh, if you know your purpose and your identity, then how you will live, what you will do naturally flows from that, that mm -hmm. clarity of your purpose and identity. And that's going to be what is most sustainable. I'll stop, share, share screen here. That's what's going to be most sustainable is if it is true for you and you're not trying to be someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what God wants for each of us. He has a specific calling for every single one of us at every point in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, but to really lean into that, I think, is important. Another best next step, if I can throw one in there, yeah, please do. ask and answer those three questions. And, and Carrie's right. It, it takes hard work. It takes thought and prayer and, and feedback from other trusted truth tellers. It really is a journey. Um, it's not just a plug and play and one and done. But the next thing I think is of, of very helpful value, I give this assignment to anyone I coach or, or build into, and it sounds simpler than it is. <laughs> I want you to think of what are the three verbs that describe you when you're at your best, where it's truly you showing up, amazing fruit happens, you feel most fully alive, you are energized. What are those three verbs? And they have to be verbs. Yeah. Most of the time people come up with adjectives. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it's got to be a verb because it's you in action. Yeah. That's good. So I, I challenge uh, both of you and your, your audience to uh, really dive into that seemingly simple assignment that is not that simple. Yeah. But here's where I like, um, I like the value of it, not only in just self-discovery, but really living with intentionality. Because mm -hmm. especially as, you know, women, as leaders, as people who have capacity, we get things done. Guess what happens? We're always asked to, hey, can you chair this committee? Can you lead this, this event? Can you, can you, can you, can you? And yeah, we probably can, you know, there's a lot of things we can do, yeah. but especially when you get to uh, at least my stage in life, you need to be using the best you can bring, you yeah. know, to have that, that eternal and temporal impact for good. And so those three verbs help, I think, serve as a litmus test for what you'll say yes to and what you'll say no to. And that is freeing as well. That's, I love what you said about the, having the truth tellers in your, in your life. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's huge. Yep. Oh, that, that's gold right there because there, there really are so many, it feels like there are so many options mm -hmm. and I, and, and there are lots of ways that we can show up, but we want to honor God the way he's created us to be. So let's show up in, in our best in the way he's created us. And so by, by establishing those three verbs, I think that would be, that's a great um, way, like kind of like test of yourself to, to, to be able to say a confident yes a confident no or a confident not not right now because I think season plays into that too would you yeah. say with those verbs yeah yeah absolutely yeah there's a young woman that I'm I have the privilege of discipling and she's super accomplished just you know very high capacity young lady just graduated college starting her career and um, is really passionate about uh, she's actually found her calling which is delightful uh, she's really passionate about that loves Jesus and and she mm -hmm. loves to help others. She's empathetic. She loves to serve. And so guess what happens? Everybody wants her yeah. to do this. You know, her pastor help needs her here or this. And she she was saying yes to too many things, which mm -hmm. I think sometimes as women, we can tend to do. And uh, that three verbs um, exercise mm -hmm. really helped her to know, okay, time out. I need to free up capacity. So I can step into that with intentionality and not just say yes to all these good things mm -hmm. that may be taking me away from where I could be most impactful. Right. And so, um, yeah, it's like I said, it's a simple exercise, but it really has uh, pays great dividends in, in work and in life. 
So as you have taken this journey throughout your own leadership lifeline, Mm -hmm. how have you honed the art of knowing your capacity and knowing how to say no or if it it is your best yes? Because Carrie and I, we just uh, recorded an episode a couple sessions ago about yes, no, I don't know. Like, how do you say those three things? How has that worked for you in your in your life, Kitty, with what you're doing? I mean, because you you started at the top of the show, like you're you you're you were a wife, a mom, uh, a, a leader in in different avenues. I mean, like that alone is a lot for for the average person. So, and and you've done a lot of leadership over your time. So, how have you? Let me go back to my original question. Learn to say the yes, no, and I don't know. Great question. Um, honestly, the three verbs exercises really helped me. There were many, many years in my life where I said yes to stuff because, you know, I care. I love the mission, you know, love, love to help. Um, but when you say yes to something, it means you're saying no to something else, yeah. whether overtly or not. Right. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm not the poster child for managing capacity well because <laughs> I love to um, I love to help others or serve or come alongside. But what has helped me is just being really clear about my my purpose, my mission, and it's to build strong kingdom leaders. And so if I have an opportunity to build into someone who is teachable, wants to grow, and I believe they have the capacity to really impact others, I will give up my time to step in and come alongside. Um, and that's true with my built to lead practice. It's true with uh, what I do through prime movers. It's true with ministry. I lead, I um, serve and, um, knowing that if I say yes to something that's, that's nice or fun, but doesn't use the best that I can bring, mm-hmm. um, then maybe I'm, I'm missing something, right. I'm missing something yeah. that God is actually calling me to do. Yeah. We know from, uh, what is it? Second Chronicles 16, nine, you know, that the, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to strongly support someone who is fully devoted to him. And so, you know, I, I always have that playing in the back of my mind, Lord, I know you're going to strongly support me. If you're calling me into this, um, mm-hmm. please make it really clear if you're not calling me into this, mm-hmm. um, or maybe in a season. So, you know, Carrie, I'd love to get more involved in the church. I'm hoping my capacity frees up a little bit. Um, But that's an example I've had to say. That's a great. Yeah. I've had to say, no, I'm sorry. It's not, not my time right now. Um, And to be honest, the church and helping and serving in that way is a good thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kingdom minded. It aligns with your worldview, but because you you might not have the margin for it in this season. And I think that speaks to something else too, about the relational aspect of saying no to somebody. Cause sometimes I feel like we say yes, because we're fearful of what, their response will be to that now. So how do we get okay with that? I mean, mm-hmm. I know not everybody suffers from the people pleasing, uh, the people pe- pleasing gene. Uh, but for those that do, I think that that's a really like hard thing for them to, to work through. Sometimes you have thoughts on that. I do. Um, something that's helped me. And then I, I've seen it be of value in others' lives is, you know, if, if you're being asked to do something, you don't have capacity, or maybe mm, I don't know that I'm the best person to help there you can say no, but I know someone who can help, right? You, you don't, it, it's that sense of responsibility. We have to really steward carefully. You know, are we responsible to solve everyone's problems? No. Are we responsible to help everyone who, who needs help? No, but we might know someone who does. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you, if you pray about it and think about it and ask godly counsel, should I do this, especially for big decisions, mm-hmm. um, you know, then you land on it. You can either say yes, or you can say no love what you're doing, but that's, that's not, you know, in alignment with, with my gifts or abilities or whatever, but I know someone who can help. Yeah. And, uh, just that the power of a referral. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you never know that might be the answer to someone's prayer who really so does want to find, you know, their place of meaningful service. And that might be the perfect fit for them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Where God was using us as the stepping stone, but have we taken that stepping stone away from that person and and used it for ourselves where, you know, God will figure out, you know, his purposes will be made, you know, he'll, he'll get, make it happen, but, but it could have happened in that way versus, you know, another, another way we're, we're taking that from someone else. That's good. Yeah. You mentioned, um, you know, prayer and, and seeking out God and, and wise counsel. Um, are, would you say those are kind of the core spiritual disciplines or practices that you do 
um, in order to, you know, do these next right, next right steps or, or, or saying yes or no, uh, can you expand upon that? Are there any others or there, there, is there anyone particular that in your life, you're like, this is how God speaks to me kind of thing? Great question. Um, I'd say first and foremost, I start, I start every day in prayer uh, and every day in prayer, start every day in his word and every day in his word. Um, I even have a, a friend gave me this diagram of the full armor of God. And I liked it so much that I printed it out and I have it on uh, my closet door. So first thing in the morning before I actually get dressed, I vi- visually You're putting it on. Yeah. Um, in the armor of God. And then at, at night, I still put it on <laughs> before, I, you know, <laughs> okay. before I put my jammy on. I'll, I'll still put the full armor of God on. <laughs> so really just walking closely, being in the word, being in prayer, having, um, you know, some of my favorite praise music playing, uh, you know, just, just filling my, uh, my being with, with his presence, I think is key. And then having trusted truth tellers, especially if you get to a decision, that's a really big one. Um, have that go-to set of, you know, two, three, four people who know you well, who are going to tell you truth and love. Um, I know the, the times when I've had to make some really big decisions, I, I've got my go-to, you know, and, and some are guys, brothers in Christ who know me really well, who've walked with me through um, just over the last 20 plus years and, and close sisters in Christ as well. Um, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll ask, you know, what am I missing here? Yeah. Good you know, question. What am I missing? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, what's another way I can I can look at this situation? Um, when have you seen me at my best? Mm. What should I start doing? What should I stop doing? Those are just all kinds of great feedback questions that, you know, if you have a set of trusted truth tellers, they will they will give you what you need to hear and uh, just. But it takes a, a bit of spiritual maturity to be able to ask those questions and then to receive them as well. So. That, sure. that takes some getting used to as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's it's a good discipline uh, in life. It really is. So um, yeah. when you talk about you, you say you've been a men, you're being, you know, you are meant a mentor discipling um, the next generation. Uh, you have those in your life. Can you give us some practical ways of finding those people? Because I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, especially as high capacity leaders, you know, you say, you know, one of the melodies in your life is that leadership. And, you know, mine wasn't a monkeys club, but mine was a Hanson club um, that I got nominated president for. So I totally resonate with that story. Awesome. That's awesome. I also think it's funny that you said that this is a total sidebar. This has nothing to do with leadership <laughs> lifeline. But when you talked about how your friends chose the guys first and that you got the kind of dorky one I, the same thing happened to me mine wasn't Hanson's Carrie it was new kids on the block and I got that I got the ugliest one of that group <laughs> <laughs> I'm finding a top a common thread between all three of us that, that is hilarious God has such a great sense of humor that all of us have been, in the I've been there before <laughs> oh, um, but but as as leaders I do find that I am pouring out a ton um and it's not it, it, it's not always easy for me to find the the mentor to lead me and i've i've gotten there you know but i'd love your opinion on how do you get there how did you get there or how would you advise our listeners to get there because i do think that that circle that that the people truth tellers i love that phrase um is vital in our next right steps vital um i'd say first and foremost just have have a spiritual sensitivity and your eyes open for who has God brought into your life. Uh, one of my best mentors, I'll try and say it without share it without crying. Um, was a beloved woman named Ann King back in Houston. I was a newlywed, like I said, with the hard hat and heels and uh, had married a, a pastor at the time. He was a, um, on staff of a huge church so, as an associate pastor. And Ann King was the widow of the pastor emeritus just an amazing godly woman. She was in her eighties. She somehow knew this old girl needed help. (laughs) And so every Sunday I would, for a year, I would spend uh, with Anne and she would just build into me and uh, disciple me and help me understand what it is to be a pastor's wife, to help me understand what it is to be in ministry and, and to care for a family, all those things. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, she, like I said, was was older and in a uh, basically assisted living uh, facility. And so I would sit with her every Sunday afternoon and just listen and learn and absorb. And right across uh, from where we would sit for our weekly meetings, she had this beautiful plaque and was blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And I can still see it in my mind's eye. And Anne King was discipling me and building into me when she couldn't see me anymore. She had lost her. And it was so powerful. Um, So God has people that he brings into our lives who either like Anne, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So she came to me and said, hey, I'd love to love to meet with you. It can be something that gentle, or mm-hmm. it could be somebody who um, who you see in your life that maybe it's a young person that you see tremendous potential, tremendous mm-hmm. capacity. Mm-hmm. And you you can take that initiative. Hey, would you would you be interested in me coming alongside you just like Anne did for me? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also be willing yourselves, no matter what stage of life you're in. Seek out that builder, seek out that mentor, seek out that person who can disciple you, who maybe is a little farther down the road. Um, I know after I you know, came through the widowhood journey, uh, others have referred women to me over the years. Hey, could you meet with her? She's really struggling, um, that kind of thing. So a lot of times too, you just take, take the life experiences, good, bad, broken, whatever, and the Holy Spirit redeems those as you build into others and as you come alongside. Yeah. For, sure. For sure. I saw something the other day. It was, it was on social media. And I just, it's very appropriate to the conversation in terms of uh, the calling and the lifeline that the Lord has just uniquely gifted each one of us to. And it was about this gentleman talking about how he went to the funeral of one of the moms of uh, a friend of his, his daughter's Um playmates or whatever. And she was very, very well-known attorney, very successful attorney. And he said, nobody at the funeral even mentioned her job description. Not one person. It was about who she was as a person, a person, her character, all of the verbs and all of the things. People were giving adjectives to describe her in that setting. But he said, it's not surprising, but when I sat and thought about it, she, she, we have to work to build, not, um, a resume virtue, but a eulogy virtue. And to think about all three of those questions, all three of those things that you had at the, the, the center of the show in terms of how you center yourself on your purpose, your calling, your next steps, thinking, thinking that through, is this something that I want to be remembered for? Is this something that I want to leave as a legacy? I don't think we think about that often. We don't, we, we're here in the now where it's in the present. We're not looking, maybe, maybe some people are depending on their stage of life. But I think for the average person, you're just going through the day, all, not thinking about who's going to be at your funeral, who's going to be hearing what what is said. But to stop and have some of that eternal perspective, I think, is is a healthy practice to engage in. Um, mm-hmm. That's more of a declarative statement, statement, not really a question for you, Kitty. But I think it fits, you know, just in terms of how do we want to be remembered um, and, and what we're doing with our life. Actually, that's uh, a, a perfect lead in Angela <laughs> for um, what really spurred me on to be uh, s- super clear about my calling. Uh, my my late husband was completely sold out for Christ, uh, an amazing pastor, an amazing builder of leaders. And um, there were over 700 people at his funeral. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> what people shared about Um, you know, what they learned from him, how he impacted them. He's been gone many years. I still have people reach out and share, hey, I was remembering this is what Larry helped me with here. Just amazing. And so that term legacy really, uh, when I kind of got my sea legs back after that sudden shock and got my kids, you know, a little bit more settled, um, that term legacy kept coming. And um, that's what God used to spur me on to um, this deep dive into really being clear about my purpose because, <clears throat> excuse me, Larry was only 55 when he passed. Mm-hmm. Um, no, no warning signs. He was healthy as a horse, lifelong athlete. And I thought, wow, I, I may not have five more years left. You know, yeah. I want to make sure every single day counts. And every single thing I say yes to is what God has put me here to do. Yeah. Um, and so I would just encourage you and your audience to really think that one through because um, who knows, he may call me home tomorrow. I just want to be able to stand there and hear 
well done. You did that. Yeah, same. Ugh. I mean, I think that's a great, great way to end the show. I mean, yeah. there's nothing more to say. Um, I mean, we there probably we could have other words, but but that's such a beautiful and true way of living our lives. Um, and so, thank you for that. Sure. But, this, to be honest, Kitty, is a show that I think we could go back and listen to. You've pulled so many nuggets of just helpful content and information that we could just sit in each one of these things and kind of have a deeper dive. And so thank you for that alone. I think so oftentimes we listen to things or we watch something online and, and we, we don't necessarily leave with tangible tools in, in, our, in our arsenal to move forward in this, this life or in these next steps. So you, you have definitely given us a lot of equipping tools. So thank you for doing that. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. And it's been really uh, just a delight to get to know both of you and, and share this time together. So thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. And to all of our fellow warrior raisers, aim your arrows well. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening to the Warrior Razor podcast. If you liked today's episode, please like, subscribe, and share it. Or for more information, feel free to follow us on www.warriorrazor.com. <laughs>